Football, football, football is back. It's been a long time, baby, but we made it. It's time to play some football. I wasn't sure all summer if it was going to happen. I don't think anybody was quite sure. The NFL and its member clubs have done a phenomenal job. They have worked collectively implementing all kinds of measures to get this season going. Beautiful day for some football. I feel 100% confident that I will be safe in this environment. What you're seeing is the result of the protocols and the planning that, that really has been in place for about six months. We started all of this response essentially back in March of this year. The coronavirus is having a major impact in the sports world. The NFL draft coming up on the 23rd will look very much like a fantasy draft. A lot of logistics to figure out, but this is reality now. Everyone's still concerned with how this is going to affect the players both physically and mentally in the coming weeks. COVID was really ramping up. All of us were filled with a lot of questions. It was a, it was a novel and emerging disease that was unlike viruses that we had seen before. And so we all had to stop and pause what we were doing to take steps back and to ask ourselves, what's our response? With COVID, the NFL contacted us and asked us to participate in trying to set up a return to football by the fall. This has been a long and thoughtful process to really sit down and get all the important facts out on the table committees were being put together. You're talking about infectious disease experts, epidemiologists, public health specialists, laboratory medicine experts. We closed our team facilities. We completely reimagined our draft. But we also started to think about the implications because we knew this would be a long-term process. The most important thing to everyone was the health and safety of the players and the staff. The number of people that were governing would be 2,200 NFL players and approximately 4,000 staff, which are coaches, trainers, equipment people, et cetera. So it's about 6,200 people. This is a process in evolution and every day we've gotten better. Sometimes our recommendations, we put them in pencil, not pen, because several weeks later, things would evolve and we would have to adapt and change. We've come together to come up with a pretty good protocol. Every one of our clubs submitted an IDER plan, as we call it, I-D-E-R, which stands for Infectious Disease Emergency Response Plan. And basically, that's a plan where they took our protocols and what we outlined and said, how do we translate that to our individual club? What does that look like in our club environment? And it has everything in it from what our ventilation system is in the building to how we're going to socially distance at meetings, sanitizing, how much PPE we have, how we're going to handle food service, how we're going to handle travel and how we're going to handle game day. And it is our it's our rule book for COVID. They give us some continuity of how we want to care for guys and continuity how we want to make sure that we have a good ecosystem to keep all of our athletes and staff and families healthy and safe. Once we got closer to having our players back, I became our infectious control officer, which is basically the COVID police. The ICO has really been developed by the league to oversee all of the COVID mitigation and protocol policies that have been put in place for the, the 2020 season. This is primarily a, a virus that spread through close contact uh, of respiratory droplets. We wanted to minimize the physical contact between individuals. And so the committees put together a three-tier system. Tier one would be the players or really the essential football personnel that are gonna have direct prolonged contact with the players. Doctors, coaches would be tier one. Tier two individuals, football personnel that are essential, but they may not be in close proximity on a consistent basis. So that may be a general manager or an owner, for example. And then lastly, tier three, these are individuals who perform important functions in the facility or in the stadium, but don't necessarily have to have direct prolonged contact with the football players. So an example may be food or kitchen personnel. The reason that we split into tiers is because our tier people are allowed in certain areas. So we have restricted areas in the building that are only allowed for tier one and tier two and players. And then the tier three people can only come into those restricted areas when there's no tier one, tier two, or players are in the building. 
The tier systems are a really good way of making sure that our ecosystem has the appropriate amount of people. Uh, number one, to make sure everybody can do their job, but two, make sure we're not adding any increased exposure to too many people. We've had one mantra that's, that's driven across all of that, and that is we're gonna make the safest and best possible medical decision at each stage along the way based on the facts that we have in hand at that time. Players, coaches, and staff were all on virtual meetings really beginning in March. As we all have seen, the amount of information online is massive, much of it not as accurate as we'd like. So I think our goal was to give them accurate information about the process that they were going to undertake as they began to return to play football. Good to see your faces, man. Educating our, our staff and all of our players was probably the most critical thing we can do. We got to keep this ecosystem right. But if we do those things the right way, we keep the ecosystem clean. When we get on the grass, we can go play with a quiet in mind and focus on doing football the right way. We can do all these things and have to be prepared to have all these different policies and procedures, but if we don't educate people on the why, it just it's not gonna stick. And if you have any questions you need to ask, and if I can't answer them, I'm gonna get you to answer. Initially, they had a lot of questions, a lot of anxiety about how we were gonna handle our business. Hey coach, we won't have time to go home. What about team travel? Are we gonna be distancing? Yeah, when we get these results back. Back to the traveling part. How does that work? Hey coach. Yo, coach. coach. Coach, coach, coach. Hey, coach. 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 A lot of those meetings and conversations, it wasn't just about educating the players, but it was really educating the players, their family, spouses, significant others, thoughtful questions regarding the transmission risk of kids. Is it safe to go back to school? It just showed the vast interest and concern that people had regarding this virus. You know, as a team sport, they look upon each other and support each other. And I don't think anybody, including staff, coach, doctor, trainer, athlete, None of us want to be the reason that this doesn't work for our team. It's all about remaining vigilant, not letting our guard down. Whenever we relax is when we become vulnerable. You know, we got to conduct ourselves accordingly. There's been a lot of work to position ourselves to be where we are right now. Um, you know, it's, it's one fail, all fail in this environment. And so we're going to continue to package the messaging that way. What I tried to do when we did that is try to keep it simple. We came up with a little thing called mesh for us specifically with the Rams was mask, education, social distancing, and hygiene. We thought if we can dominate and be elite in those four areas, that we have a good chance of success in our ecosystem. One of the educating points to our team was, this isn't gonna feel normal because it's not normal. Dude, see bash keep the dog on camera, keep you out of there. I want this to be seamless so you guys can focus on football. Testing protocol is very, very important. 100% buy-in. I haven't had a single player miss a test. I haven't had a single coach miss a test. We are testing players, coaches, and staff daily. The nasal swab's not bad. You do get accustomed to them. And more than anything, it's quick and easy and, and doesn't take that long. I'm not used to having things stuck up my nose, but that's nah, good. I'm glad that we're all getting tested. The PCR test that is done with a nasal swab that takes overnight. We get those results back within 24 hours. We also do have point of care antigen tests available for which the results tend to come back in about 20 minutes. We use those point of care tests more for confirming the test results from the PCR test or if someone develops new symptoms. One of the things we always point out is that the tests simply are a report card showing how good a job we've done on all the other measures to mitigate infection. One of the foundational principles that we've had since we started our testing program is that we did not want it in any way to have a negative impact on the general public or on testing that's done in healthcare centers. So we contracted with an independent company who is doing the testing across all 32 of our clubs. That company does not rely on resources or materials that are in the team's market. And so we collect those tests, we send them out to be processed at a, at a group of laboratories that are basically an entire separate network that that company has set up. What we've been amazed at is my reference lab has done a really remarkable job in, in that they're able to test 100 people in you know 60 minutes. 
We'll do about 6,000 tests per day across the NFL and our 32 teams. That's somewhere between 40 and 45,000 tests per week when we add in the extra personnel we test on game day. I think we're doing some unprecedented amount of testing. I think there's a tremendous amount of data and research that can be done from what the NFL has been able to put together. It's an interesting time in the National Football League because entry into the facility from the very beginning has changed. They come into the building using touchless technology to open the door. Go time now. The signage is unbelievable. I mean, like when you walk in, there's stuff on the floor. The arrows for the traffic within the building stay on one side. It's almost like a street. They're greeted by somebody who takes their temperature. 96.6, good to go. They have been told to do their app, which has screening questions if they're having any symptoms. The, the people checking the thermometers check their app to make sure that they have a green check and that they had all negative answers to their questions. Then they get a Connexon contact tracer assigned to them, and then they go about their business. These proximity monitors, we all wear them when we walk in the building, and it keeps track of whom we're next to based to their proximity monitor and for how long we're next to them. And these monitors, if you're closer than six feet to someone, it actually blinks red. So it's a great reminder to make sure that you're not closer. I look at all the contacts and I try to sort out the, the alerts first and then I'll try to see whether there's a pattern. So maybe I have six, seven guys that are had close contact for like 45 minutes an hour. I know that they were in a meeting at that time. So I could talk to a coach and say, let's spread them out. Or I could talk to individual players, say you were too close together. Everything has been reorganized and prioritized with player safety, coaches safety, staff safety as the number one thing trying to mitigate the spread by you know spreading things out it's that simple we really try to try to keep limitations of how many people we can have in confined places 15 people at a time in a, in a weight room so what we did is we made two weight rooms we're very fortunate to be la and uh, in, in la so i always call it indoor outdoor living so we're able to kind of make a, a weight room outside to create two weight rooms so now we can have two sets of 15 people going it allows us to be more efficient throughout our day same with the locker room we spread out our locker room and did every other locker with COVID-19, you, you've had to change some technology. And so we have touchless faucets, touchless urinals. We have touchless doors to come in the building. In the athletic training room in medicine, we've made all individual serving. So used to have the big pump of whatever kind of rub. And now they're all in individual cups. A little bit of technology, but a little bit of common sense too. There's sanitization stations when you enter as well as within the middle of the facility. So at any point, you can sanitize anything you want from a phone to your footwear to your glasses. There's numerous stations throughout the facility. So sanitizing the facility is an undertaking like none other. I feel like I'm at Disney where somebody's always behind you cleaning. So you go through a door and somebody's wiping a handle or I get a notification every night after my office has been cleaned and sanitized. When players or staff are in one space, when they leave that space, we're always backing behind them and making sure that we're cleaning all those touch points. And not just cleaning the rooms now, but cleaning more of your touch points, your door handles, your tables, your chairs, making sure they're all using EPA registered products to make sure the hospital grade products that we know we're killing all the various viruses out there, specifically Corona. We, we really adopted the hydrostatic sprayer which is a sprayer, a particular one that we use, that we can actually spray various touch points a lot quicker. So now we're not sitting there wiping everything down. We can go in there and spray a whole room. It's safe. We don't have to worry about it getting on anything that's gonna obviously cause any type of issues from a skin issue or um, respiratory issue. And it allows us to get a lot of variants really quickly. Team leaves and are coming back in 10 minutes. We can go in there, spray the whole room down, spray the training room down, and people can come back in within 10 minutes and we have a sterile room. The more space we have, the more light it needs. It's going to get all the good, bad, and uglies in a room. Is literally select that room, hit submit, hit continue, and then this green button. That's some of the strategies we did within our facility to reduce spread. In the event of a positive test, 
The first thing is we isolate the person. And we treat those cases like they have COVID until proven otherwise. The team physician and the infection control officer will be notified. We'll immediately isolate that athlete. We'll retest them with a nasal PCR swab and also do a rapid point of care test. The few that have happened have come in at night when they're home and we notify them that they shouldn't come in in the morning except for a drive-through test. And then we make sure they've got a thermometer and an oxygen meter. We want to keep them away from the team until they fully recovered and are no longer a risk for, for spreading infection. At the same time, we immediately go into what we call contact tracing. These proximity sensors have been very helpful in terms of helping us look at the kinds of contacts people do have. So close contact, we're defining as less than six feet for more than 15 minutes. And the whole key component for the Connect sign is really to take the guessing game out of contact tracing. That's the best way to look at it. What typically happens in contact tracing where when someone is infected, they get a phone call saying, well, tell me who all the people are, are that you were around over the past two days and how close were they standing to you and for how long were they around you? That's a really hard estimate to, to make on an accurate basis. And that's why we feel like the contact tracing system we have in place with these proximity tracking devices gives us a lot more precision and a lot more accuracy than what we would see in typical contact tracing. I think the biggest thing is just knowing if there is a positive kind of there protocol to move forward. It was comforting. We have a dashboard software program that we can go to. We can look at and see every single person that's been around that confirmed positive. We can isolate those players. We can quarantine and then we can go through the testing protocols per the NFL to make sure the spread obviously doesn't continue on and make sure more, more, more importantly that um, everybody's healthy and safe. We have connects on contact tracers and testing in the building, but we have a whole world outside the building. And so we've had to ask our players to take responsibility in reporting symptoms and possible contacts with people who are COVID positive. So when we get these positive tests, we are using the CDC recommended timeframe of uh, if they're symptomatic, 10 and one, meaning that they have to be out for 10 days and one day of no symptoms, uh, symptoms defined by fever, body aches, et cetera. The other re-entry pathway is two negative PCR tests separated by a 24 hour time period, therefore documenting there's no virus left in their body. The final thing is anyone who has test positive must undergo cardiac testing. It's a well-known medical fact that after viral illnesses of, of many different types that you can have cardiac complications. You can have uh, inflammation or infection in the heart itself. And so we put into place from the very start with our protocols a three-step screening process for anyone who's tested positive for COVID at any time since the pandemic began. The committee was so thoughtful uh, and really implemented this, what I'll say, the most rigorous cardiac testing program with EKG, troponin blood work, looking for inflammation, echo, and in some cases, cardiac MRI, a highly sensitive test. This is the first time we're dealing with a lot of this, so we do have strict protocols on how we advance guys back. I just ran 600 yards. And then lastly, they go through a graded exertion protocol where we're gradually ramping up the amount of exercise, and that's done under the supervision of the club medical staff before they're finally cleared from their infection. We talk about a performance triangle, which is nutrition, hydration, training, which is practice in lifting weights and running, and then sleep. And I think that this triangle has really become important to them now during this COVID time. We all have been in this quarantine state for a long time and it's really changed our new normal and it affects every single person differently. We really want to take up the time to not only physically make sure that they're doing well, but even from a mental and emotional standpoint that they're, they're up to part two, because that can be a missing piece if we don't think about that. A lot of folks, when they lie in bed, their mind starts going. And I think when people are worried about their health or their families or their performance, it's hard to turn off. Mental well-being is really important, especially when you have life stressors like a pandemic. So I think that understanding how sleep plays a role and exercise plays a role in, in balancing people out is very, very important. Sleep has two functions, really. The non-REM sleep, which is the majority of our sleep as adults, is where you build back up physically. It's where growth hormone is made, which helps you to repair. 
It's where you help build protein and muscle mass. REM sleep, which is your rapid eye movement, dream sleep. That, think of that as the emotional part. Our dreaming part is where we consolidate memory, where we work out emotional issues. Given what's going on now, we all really need to get our sleep. I don't think there's any doubt that getting good restorative sleep is essential to your immune system, um, let alone your, your benefits from, from the sports performance standpoint. To the goal line, he powers in, touchdown Elliott! He puts his towel down his jersey, uses it as a bib, his patented spooning motion saying, feed me. Just like anybody else in America, Food intake has become a social event. We got all kinds of options over here. Yeah, we eat healthy around here. And that's no different when you're with an NFL team or in a locker room. You can't do that anymore. You have to be socially distant. We do know that when you're uh, in close contact and eating together, you can have viral spread through respiratory droplets. We've transitioned to an app where you can order your food. Call it like a Grubhub for athletes or Grubhub for NFL teams. And then when we get there, it's waiting for us. Appreciate you. Thank you so much. Lunch time. All the cooks and everybody that's serving is in full PPE and you order what you want. And if you're lucky, you get one of the seats at one table. And if not, you go down to your locker and you spread out or you go outside and eat. Such a critical piece because now we eliminated lines, waiting in line, people are next to each other. It's been seamless and it's created such an efficiency for us that not only is it something that we'll take with us from the COVID perspective, but obviously we're gonna take this on even when COVID's um, behind us and, and just created so much more efficiency with our food service um, system. Travel in the National Football League has always been top notch and it will continue to be top notch. It'll just be less people. In some ways, think of this as traveling in a virtual bubble. And one of the key components, obviously, to traveling is, is making sure that we, we keep our ecosystem as virus free as possible as we pick it up and move it place to place and city to city. Everyone that's in the travel party will get a nasal swab PCR done on Friday. That result will be in by Saturday morning and double checked. Assuming that it's negative, they're allowed to get on the plane and travel with the team. We're gonna have probably 40 to 50 less people travel on our plane because we just want a social distance on the plane. And we're bought in more buses than we've ever used. And then when you go to the hotels, the same thing, making sure that the sanitation protocols that we went up hold in the league are upheld at these various hotels. We're gonna have limited access in the hotels to areas that are common. So for example, can't go to outside restaurants, can't use the gym unless it's only used for the players. Outside transportation, ride shares are discouraged. So there's lots of things that have gone into place with these protocols to really limit any risk or exposure from the outside. We'll have whole floors of a hotel blocked off just for our people who are tested. One of the benefits for some of the young guys is everybody gets a single room on the road now. Previously at the Chiefs, you had to be a four-year veteran to get your own room, but everybody's gonna have their own room and we're gonna get in and get out of those hotels. We're not gonna spend as much time there. So travel's gonna be a little different, but it'll still be good because this is truly now pure business. The purpose of travel is to go play football. You've been tweaking the protocols all along. Last night, another tweak. Uh, the teams were told that there's going to be testing on game day. That had not been the case for everyone up until this point. Why do that now? We've learned a great deal about testing. We've learned more about transmission. We've learned more about vulnerability. And so as we've looked at situations, and particularly these situations where we have had transmission within a team, uh, we identified what we think is a window of vulnerability that we believe that testing on game day can help us close. Folks, it wasn't easy, but let the games begin. A tumultuous, unprecedented offseason, no preseason games, training camp like no other partner as we start our 12th year together. What do you expect to see tonight? I'm just so happy that these guys are out here playing football. You know, I think America needed it. I think I needed it. I'm just ready to watch it. All of our clubs had to submit an infectious disease response plan for their stadiums as well. And that, that plan is not dealing with the team-based activities, but how the stadium would operate if fans were present. And it covers everything from ticketing and entrance to concessions and restrooms and seating and sanitization and sterilization, every aspect of the stadium's operations. All the various things to make sure that now 
when this ecosystem of players and staff come into the stadium that we can be successful. When we arrive, the, the locker room is supposed to be disinfected by the home team if we're the road team. But we are bringing our own PPE and sanitization materials to disinfect ourselves as well once we arrive and then after we set up. So you're trying to follow what the protocols are and then go above and beyond. All the stuff that we're doing at the facility, those will be applied as well. Temperature check, the signage, picking up your contact tracing device, the plexiglass in the lockers, those protocols are going to be applied at the stadium as well. Let's go family out there, one, two, three, family. Let's go, let's go. The number of people on the field is going to look a lot different than it did. There will be no cheerleaders, no sideline reporters, no pregame folks standing around. There'll be no guests on the field before the game. So the pregame is going to look dramatically different. One of the first things you'll notice before the game is only one captain on the field for the coin toss from each team. They will have masks on. Make sure we stay socially distanced, okay? We will. There won't be any handshaking or anything like that, so that'll be right off the bat. Woo! You know what time it is. And during the game, it's going to look different too. And off we go, the 2020 NFL season is underway. I think everybody wants to know how the game is going to be different without fans or limited fans. I think that'll be a little adjustment to your eyes if you're watching on TV. We just work and we happy to be back at work, baby. We hope y'all happy watching us. The NFL is going to use crowd noise at about an 80 decibel rate. And so they'll pump it in for the stadiums that don't have fans. Once you're playing, there's nothing different. There's, not, there's nothing different. But, you know, if you're one of those guys who get your energy from the crowd, the noise, it could be tough to get up. But, you know, if you're if you're just intrinsically motivated and just love to compete, it's, it's no different than it has ever been. Our stadium is one of the loudest in the league, and it's the loudest outdoor stadium. It's reached decibels of 142. So at 80, it'll be like the vacuum cleaner running. This is weird. This is one of two stadiums. The other is Jacksonville that will host some fans. They say about 22% of this stadium, which holds about 76,000. So tonight's crowd will be 16, 17,000, somewhere in that area. And they are all spaced apart. And they're all supposed to be wearing their masks except when eating or drinking. A decision about allowing fans into a stadium is a complex one, but it's really made primarily at the local level by the dialogue between the team and the local public health authorities. I think in the stadiums that have fans, you'll notice how far spread out they are. And in our stadium, we are doing pods, so to speak. So four seats together for a family, and then there's a lot of space between the next pod. In-game protocols for the sidelines, they have changed those so much with individualized bottles. Every single player has to have their own individualized bottle now, so we're not sharing bottles. And we used to have 10, 15 bottles that were circulating through a football team. Now we're talking about on game day having 48 bottles available for guys. The first thing that you'll notice is people on the bench that are workers like myself and the equipment managers and the physicians will all have face masks on, cloth face mask or disposable face mask. Our coaches will all have either face mask or face shield. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. But we've also got other things you may not notice. Referees, for example, are using uh, electronic whistles that are handheld as opposed to something they would put in and out of their mouth to blow. You'll see drastically different timeouts and towel use. Gatorade has provided a large amount of towels for game day on the home side and visitor side. I believe the minimum number is 600 that you have to provide for each sideline. Once a player or coach or staff, anyone uses a towel to wipe sweat or anything, it's done. It's picked up, it's put in a dirty bin, and next time they need a towel, they get a new fresh towel. You have to clean and sanitize all the field equipment and footballs daily after each use and before each use. So same thing will be applied to game day, that the footballs will be sanitized before the game. The ball crews will have sanitization materials with them during the game to do it throughout the game as well. We're constantly looking at new technology techniques, methods, and new products to see how we can make things even safer for our game operation and ask ourselves, what can we do to mitigate risk to everyone involved? throughout the course of the game.
I've told my head coach, those three hours of football will be the best part of my life since March because we've put the protocols in place to be able to play that game. And we're going to stick with the protocols on the sideline, but we did all this to play football and entertain people across the world. Well, I always say that I hope everyone's pulling for us because what we're trying to do is carry on some degree of normalcy and some of the things that we love and enjoy doing while at the same time mitigating risk. And that's not a challenge unique to the NFL or even professional sports. This is the same question and the same challenge that's faced by our schools and by businesses and places of worship and, and, and entertainment venues. And so I think in that sense, we're all in this together, but I think we at the NFL have some unique opportunities to, to model best behaviors, to learn best practices, and then to share those with all of these other elements of society that are trying to address that same fundamental challenge of mitigating risk and yet resuming some degree of normalcy. We've educated, we've executed, and the numbers are low, and it's very gratifying to me. I think one of the things that I've really noticed with our players through COVID that I hope continues into the future is when the game was taken from them in May and June, and they weren't sure they were going to be able to play, they have taken an approach where they're so grateful to be able to practice and so grateful for the services that all the people involved in football provide that I feel like our team, we're as close now as ever before because we're all in this together. It's so awesome to have football back. It is so refreshing to see and it creates that normalcy that we haven't seen in so long. And I hope it does really help our country a little bit just to see sports again. And as tough as this has been for a lot of us, hopefully there's a lot of good that comes out of it in the future for us in football and in life. <laughs>